beyond the for those of you who are already joining I'm, uh, Jody Gale with uh, the Natural Resource and Aqua, uh, Aquaculture Committee for NACAA. Uh, we welcome you to the webinar. We'll uh, begin here in a few minutes with the introduction. So bear with us for a few minutes. While we're waiting, I might just mention uh, uh, recently uh, gone through the transition of leadership uh, within NACAA. Uh, yeah, I will start a little personal introductions as background. Uh, I'm just the incoming chairman of the, of the Natural Resource and Aquaculture Committee. Uh, so uh, this is my first time helping to host the webinar. So we're hoping it all goes well. I will uh, give due credit to, uh, to uh, uh, Scott Hawbaker, who is uh, helping uh, make this possible. We very much appreciate our presenter, and I'll introduce Laura here in a few minutes. Uh, well, my clock says it's 11 o'clock. Uh, 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 I'm Jody Gale with uh, Utah State University Cooperative Extension. Uh, uh, we're here in central Utah. I serve as the chairman uh, of the NACAA Natural Resource and Aquaculture Committee. We're very pleased as a committee to be able to host this web. We welcome all of you from the respective areas of the state. I will mention uh, it's an interesting time here in the western part of the United States. Uh, very smoky conditions, uh, drought conditions. It's, a, it's an interesting time to, uh, to deal with a lot of environmental issues going on here. Uh, we have everything from dry conditions uh, to flooding to fires, so it's a, it's a, it's a wild time. Uh, I very much appreciate NACAA and the opportunity to uh, be a member and to uh, help with NACA programs or a tremendous association. I would like to uh, just simply introduce uh, uh, Dr. Laura Tayu. I'm going to apologize for probably very uh, uh, mispronouncing your name, but she's with the University of Florida. Uh, she serves uh, uh, at both the University of Florida as well as this. And we're very pleased to have uh, her with us today as our presenter and speaker, and we will turn the time to her and I'll ask her to more fully introduce herself. Uh, as we move into her presentation, uh, towards the end, we will open chat for uh, questions and there'll also be a question and answer period. Uh, please note that this is being recorded. Uh, as following uh, the webinar, you will receive short evaluation Scott Hawbaker within ACA. We would plead with you to Please watch for it to fill that evaluation out. We promise it'll be short and uh, that will provide a little bit of feedback to not only guide our as we provide these webinars, uh, but other NACAA sponsored webinars uh, that will be in the future. Uh, with that, Laura, uh, go ahead and take it. All right, thank you, Jody. I know that last name's a tricky one, but it's few. It's like a little sneeze. <laughs> well. Yeah, so. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll just get rolling on our aquaponics presentation. I appreciate all of you having me here today. I um, have a fondness for uh, ag agents. I worked very closely with many ag agents um, during my uh, career and I was actually a member of NACAA for one year and then I just had to 
cut my budget and just go with the uh, um, ANREP. So, uh, but I have close affiliations with a lot of the ag agents here in Florida and in other states. So as Jody mentioned, I am with Florida Sea Grant at the uh, University of Florida IFAS. I'm here up here in the panhandle. Uh, so I am on central time. I'm, I, I cover two counties, Okaloosa uh, and Walton County. Um, and most of my uh, programming now is in marine science education um, here on the coast. But I came to University of Florida with over 30 years of aquaculture experience from uh, Mississippi State University, uh, Kentucky State University, and 18 years at Ohio State University. So if we have any Buckeyes on the line, go Bucks. I was there a long time. Um, and it was during my time as the state specialist for aquaculture in Ohio that I started gaining experience in aquaponics. I had many of my aquaculture farmers uh, start asking questions about aquaponics and wanting to know more um, if it was a, 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 you know, an economically viable way to uh, add to their aquaculture operations. So I've been doing it on and off for 10 years. So when I came to University of Florida, um, there had been a little bit of activity before I came, but I decided to keep it as a, a sub-program. So I don't consider myself an expert, uh, but I know a lot of people who are. And so I, I thank all of you that are out there um, teaching whatever you know, and then you know reaching out to others when, when you need some help. So what is aquaponics? Well, maybe some of you are getting questions uh, that come into the office and, and that's why you're on today, you wanna know more. But basically it's a closed self-watering loop uh, system where you raise fish in tanks like you see in these tanks here. Uh, this is a system we have at Ohio State University. Uh, and it uses that fish effluent after it's been treated in a filter system to basically grow plants at an accelerated rate. But it's more than just hydroponics because you're basically managing three things in this system. You're managing the plants, the fish, and the bacteria uh, that the, provide the nitrification uh, for in your system. So how does it work? It starts here with the fish and you feed the fish. Um, a commercial diet looks a lot like a, it's a floating fish food or a sinking fish food and fish excrete ammonia over their gills and in their urine. Um, typically, uh, you know, ammonia is toxic to fish, so it has to be broken down. Um, there's a couple of different bacteria that do this job. There's uh, nitrous ammonis, which changes the ammonia into nitrite. And then there's another bacteria called nitrobacter, which then changes it into nitrate, which is what your plants need. So uh, once those bacteria have converted the ammonia, the plants can absorb the nitrates out of the system and remove them from the system, basically cleaning the water for the fish. And then the fish is returned, or the water is, the clean water is returned back to your fish tank. Uh, the system also needs oxygen, both for plant and fish health, and also for the uh, nitrification process. So why aquaponics? Um, I get uh, a lot of people are interested, especially small growers and hobby scale growers in sustainable and natural production of food. Um, in aquaponics, because of the presence of fish, it's free of pesticides, herbicides, and any chemical fertilizers. It's a highly efficient way to raise both fish and plants, especially in areas like Florida, which have you know, temperature extremes and um, high insect uh, pressure and poor soils in a lot of areas. Uh, it does conserve our, our uh, resources, both water, space, and labor. And like the title of the program, How to Make a Fish Sandwich, it produces both a protein and a vegetable crop from one uh, integrated system. So you can see here, this is a famous catfish uh, restaurant over in Bluntstown, Florida here in the Panhandle. But in this system, we can produce the lettuce and the tomatoes for the salad. Uh, we can produce cucumbers for the pickles and we can produce the catfish. Uh, now the hush puppies, that's a, that's a whole nother story, but uh, you, can't, you can't have it all. And in an aquaponic system, in, you can get continuous production of food 365 days per year, although some seasons are better than others. Getting started, this is gonna be different. I put this slide in here, but it's specific to Florida, but you're going to have a similar path um, to telling your clients to get started. The first thing they need to do is check out the legality of it. What kind of regulatory agencies monitor aquaculture and aquaponics in your state? For us, it's the Department of Agriculture and the uh, fish and wildlife uh, people. Um, I also get a lot of teachers that call me for support. And, and so I, I encourage them before they ever get started to get support from their school administration. 
Um, they have questions like, does it smell? Can you eat the produce? It is a long-term commitment. So knowing the legalities of any system is something I encourage all of my clients to check out before they get started. There's a couple of different things you need to have them consider when they're looking at different systems. Um, you can have different sizes of systems depending on what they have. You can have something small, like you see up here, just a home aquarium um, hooked up to a tub uh, with some floating plants on top if you just want to raise some herbs in your kitchen. Uh, you can go with a more medium-sized system. We're going to be talking a little bit more about using IBC totes and barrels or stock tanks um, for medium-sized systems. Uh, or you can go large where you start getting into fiberglass tanks or commercial systems. Uh, you just make, need to make sure that all the different components in your system are human safe. Um, there's basically uh, four different production methods that we see in aquaponics. Um, the one most people are familiar with is the deep water culture where you're floating these styrofoam rafts over um, anywhere from eight to 12 inches of water. Uh, and then there's the media bed, which is where you have hyd hyd hydrotin or an expanded clay gravel or a lava rock uh, in a container. And then you are um, pushing water uh, through, through that rock and you can grow your, your plants there. We'll have more pictures later. There's the nutrient film technique, which is almost the gutter systems that some of you may have seen. They call it NFT. And then there's Dutch buckets and towers, which are good for plants that have a a heavier root system um, like tomatoes or any of the root crops. Uh, every system, though, no matter which one of these techniques you use, has very similar components. You're going to need some kind of tank for the fish, a water pump to move the water, an air pump for oxygen. You're going to need plant troughs, baskets, styrofoam, media, irrigation tubing, um, a filter, some kind of filter to remove solids and to serve as a biofilter fish and plants, and in some cases, uh, grow lights and heaters, depending on uh, where you're located and the kind of climate that you're dealing with. Fish considerations is uh, something else I really encourage people to look at early on. A lot of people will call and they want to uh, raise a certain type of fish. They already have it in their, their mind, but they haven't necessarily uh, thought of all the considerations. Tilapia is the most popular in these systems because they're very hardy and typically easy to get but there are other fish too. Like for example, in the panhandle of Florida, uh, tilapia are, uh, are um, considered a species of concern because they don't want them to escape because they can escape into freshwater systems uh, and survive. And so you have to have uh, your facility inspected. Uh, there's several species that are prohibited. Um, so you need to find out in your particular state what those regulations are, what fish are allowed to be grown in these systems. If you're planning on doing this um, to make money, you really need to look at the marketing and potential markets for the different types of fish. How are you going to sell that fish, process that fish? Um, the availability of fingerlings. You don't want to raise a fish that you don't have easy access to the fingerlings for. Um, if you want to raise uh, yellow perch in Florida, you'd have to import your fingerlings from the Midwest, and that could be very uh, difficult to do. So look, start especially when you're starting out, um, Try to think about raising a fish that you can easily obtain the fingerlings locally. Also availability of feed. This has gotten a little bit easier in um, uh, recent years because of Amazon. Uh, before you really needed to get your feed from a Purina dealer and buy in large quantities. Uh, but I see more and more people selling it at small quantities uh, and you can get it delivered. Uh, you want compatibility with the plants and the bacteria. Make sure your, your fish like the same temperature as your plants and bacteria. Uh, can it survive? Do you want to grow tilapia in, you know, Canada or Minnesota where you have to heat that water all the time? Um, or would you be better off, uh, you know, raising a pool water fish in your system? You want your stocking density to match the amount of plants uh, that you want to raise because the plants is actually the bread and the butter to the system. That's where you make your money. That's where you get your most production. Your fish are uh, just a driver of the system and pretty much just the gravy. You have to think about fish health, um, feeding them a high quality food, keeping your densities optimal. And uh, we you know, try to discourage people mixing species, although I do see it all the time. Uh, so these are just things that people don't always uh, think about when they first call you and you can help walk them through uh, that process. Really in this system, the water quality is the key. And I don't know about y'all, but uh, teaching water quality is, is, I always get some pushback. People um, tend to not, 
want to learn how to test their water quality or that's uh, it's not as fun I guess as uh, feeding the fish or harvesting the the lettuce so I really do push this and I I make them do the tests with me and kind of do some hands-on training when it comes to water because you can see some of these um, things need to be measured daily uh, some you can get away with a couple of times a week and some monthly and as your system matures and you get to know your system um, like I've been running my system here now for four years I only test when I think there's a problem because I can I can kind of tell just because I'm out there all of the time. Uh, breaking in your system. This is another thing that people don't think about, and this is where a lot of error, error occurs to really break in the bacterial populations in these systems. It takes six to 10 weeks, and I get a lot of people who they get so excited, they get their system put together, and they want to put in fish right away, and then they all die. And they do this two or three times before they figure out that this is a very important part of the process is, is letting this uh, <clears throat> system uh, break in. There's multiple methods to do this. We have a good Southern Regional Aquaculture uh, document um, that addresses this. Uh, you can, um, if you can't find it yourself, you can always email me and I can get that to you. Uh, but just another consideration that I always want my clients to uh, consider when we're looking at their, their timelines. Again, uh, let's look at some of the systems that I've, I've uh, helped with over the years. This was, like I said, I worked at the Ohio State University South Centers and we had an empty greenhouse. And so we have these old tobacco float trays uh, and that we converted into an aquaponic system. So we put in these two fish tanks. Um, we started out with yellow perch. We also raised bluegill and tilapia in this system. Uh, we called this the farmer's market system because we were trying to replicate what somebody with a small space might do. And so every week we would see the different one of these rows. And so that by the end of six weeks, uh, five to six weeks, which is about how long it takes for this type of lettuce to grow, uh, we would be able to remove one row and take it to the market and then reseed another row. So, so basically we would have crops coming off every week, every week. And we considered this a medium sized system, bigger than what a family could use unless you had a very large family. Um, so probably something you could do to supplement if you were a farmer's market uh, type person or you were maybe selling to a, a restaurant. Um, this is another very cool farm in Richwood, Ohio, and they're doing great. They do a lot of training and getting people started um, in, in aquaponics too. And they uh, started out with the yellow perch because there's actually a yellow perch farm nearby. Um, they made an agreement with the farm. The farm delivers the fingerlings. They grow them up and then they sell the fish back to the yellow perch farmers so they don't have to worry about processing or marketing. And then they market all of their vegetables. They started out with doing a lot of farmers markets in the Columbus, Ohio area. And through that, they met a lot of the chefs in the kind of uh, downtown restaurant uh, area in Columbus and started marketing directly to chefs. They also had a very unique uh, marketing um, strategy where they had a lettuce club that you could sign up for. And so every week they would bring you a bag of mixed lettuce uh, from the system. And it's, it's so nice because aquaponic produce has a really long shelf life um, versus sometimes you get a bag of lettuce from the grocery store and it's like slimy two days later. Uh, this stuff lasts in the refrigerator a really long time. So a very successful um, farm that has since expanded uh, to a couple of other greenhouses. This was another uh, neat farm I worked with, Rain Fresh Harvest outside of Columbus, uh, very into the sustainable energy. And that was, uh, his main goal was to try to produce um, all this food with zero energy. So he had combined solar, windmill, and geothermal. He was raising arugula um, for a lot of the restaurant markets and uh, doing very well. Um, it was an interesting story though, because he was tracking all, he's very good at tracking all his finances. And he bought all of his solar panels and batteries for, for storage. And right about the time he had them all paid off, I believe he had a, like a 10 year on his return for investment. Um, it was time to buy all new batteries because his, his equipment basically by that time was outdated. So uh, there are challenges using uh, renewable energy uh, for these systems. Uh, this is a, another interesting story as a retired co uh, couple, but this is a, uh, way up in Ashtabula, Ohio, which is up on Lake Erie, so very northern climate. Uh, this couple retired, so they put a 200 square foot fish farm or aquaponics farm in their basement. So you can see they were using lighting 
uh, to grow their plants. Uh, they worked with the Department of Ag and, and got all the regulations as far as using clamshells and labeling and, and everything like that. And they were selling uh, quite successfully uh, to a local farmer's market uh, for a while and having a good time doing it. So you can see um, the use of space that people, it doesn't always, you don't always have to have a spare greenhouse or a barn, uh, you know, technically here, you could do it in your basement. <laughs> this is another one we worked with, the base camp at the Cincinnati Zoo. Uh, it's actually a restaurant at the Cincinnati Zoo and they wanted to showcase uh, aquaponics and grow herbs that they could actually use in the restaurant. And so they were using it as a, a teaching tool. So they used a variety of those techniques. These are the uh, deep water culture. You can see the uh, uh, basil plants floating in styrofoam on water. Uh, here is the uh, hydrotin, the expanded clay particles that they're growing in. Um, and then here they also used another type of stone in this system. So they were using it as a teaching tool and a way to grow herbs for uh, their, uh, their restaurant. Uh, Sometimes people get really creative with their backyard aquaponics. In this case, I think the kids went off to college. And so uh, they turned the, uh, the, the play set into aquaponics. They put the fish down here underneath in the IVC coat, and then they pumped the water up into the top. You can see they even have an owl for bird control here, uh, but they're growing the vegetables on the top. Um, I used to tease them. I always said, now, do you go up on the rock wall and then down on the slide or exactly, you know, <laughs> how do you get up there? So uh, another interesting uh, uh, way that you can uh, incorporate aquaponics right into your backyard. This one, if, you, if you're looking at aquaponic um, systems on the internet, this is one of the first ones that came out. Uh, I think his name was uh, Travis Hughley. Uh, it was a, a teacher who was wanting to use aquaponics in the classroom. So he, he um, created this manual. It's very good. It takes you step by step uh, through the process of building a system um, like this. And it's designed for teachers. Um, many students have used it to build and, uh, and you know, use these systems in the classroom. But if you're a handy person and you just kind of want to experiment on a small scale or just raise enough for your family, this is a really good one to start with because these blue barrels, well, they used to be fairly cheap. You used to be able to get them for, you know, $10, $15. I've seen the, the price has gone up, at least here in uh, uh, Florida. But anyway, the manual's there. It's a good one to, um, to, to look at if you're looking to just get started and, you know, get a, a, a low cost entry into it. Um, again, the small one like this, this was uh, one they put at the uh, uh, Ohio State Fair. Um, in the agriculture building, you can actually do aquaponics off of a small aquarium like this. You could uh, uh, get some totes and actually raise uh, some herbs right in your living room. And we actually do have some links to some videos uh, to, how to how, how to build small systems like this. So if that's something your client's interested in, we can uh, help them with that for sure. Uh, here's some that I worked with in Florida. I had a young lady at the local college uh, contacted me and she wanted to do aquaponics for her capstone project. Uh, so she actually designed and built the system herself. Uh, the fish are, are down below in this Rubbermaid tote that's kind of hard to see. It, she's standing in front of it here. And then the water was pumped up uh, to a filter uh, where she would remove the solids. And she, this was a little swirl separator she used. And then the water would gravity flow down into the float beds and then gravity flow back into the fish. Uh, so she successfully raised some plants in there, and it was a good uh, uh, project for her. Um, they, her whole family, they, she was working with her dad. They were, they were quite uh, extensive gardeners, and they were wanting to see if they could add this uh, aquaponics to their operation. And so uh, that was kind of the impetus for that uh, particular project. Uh, this is a school down here in Port Walton Beach, Florida. Uh, that I've been working with. I need to get some pictures of the, of the system completed, uh, but it's a special needs school. And, and a lot of times we see aquaponics being used in schools um, for people with special needs, uh, in prisons, uh, different uh, applications that you may have been asked to assist with. But they got the uh, two tanks full of fish and then they have, this is that NFT we were talking about, nutrient film technology or the gutter system. Uh, so they have one section of it, the gutter system, and then they have this other section where they're doing the deep water culture here. So they're, they're using two different techniques uh, with this system. The kids love to come in 
and uh, feed the fish. And they've even got some of the students helping uh, with the water quality. So it's a kind of a neat program. They're starting to transition into figuring out how to help the kids market uh, their product and, and you know what kind of regulatory hoops they need to jump through for that. This is another one, Westonwood Ranch. It is a uh, ranch where they uh, train young autistic adults um, in a variety of things from uh, equine management, they have goats, they have chickens, and they have aquaponics. So uh, they're raising these tanks of fish and they grow a beautiful butter crunch lettuce that they have followed that lettuce club uh, model and they have people who subscribe and the students actually harvest the lettuce clean the lettuce and deliver it to the subscribers of the service. So it's uh, been another successful uh, project down here. I've also worked a little bit with Moat Marine Laboratory down in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, Dr. Kevin Main down there is experimenting with uh, saltwater aquaponics, marine aquaponics. Um, I've seen a little bit of this coming out of Indiana as well, where they're using some of the uh, marine shrimp farms that are in recirculating systems. They're using some of that effluent to grow some plants um, that are adaptable to growing uh, in salt water. Um, and so uh, uh, that's coming up as well. So um, systems uh, won't have to discharge that salt water into the environment or deal with it. They'll be able to use it to uh, grow products. So again, our vision was to make this uh, fish sandwich and uh, we, we decided that the best way to do this because the University of Florida increasing the sustainability, profitability and competitiveness of agriculture and horticulture enterprises is one of our high priority initiatives. Um, right when I got here, I was getting all these calls of these clients. We have a lot of small farmers around here and they wanna know what are some small scale food production methods that they can use. Uh, I'm lucky in my office, like I said, I'm an aquaculture specialist but we do have a lot of agriculture and horticulture specialists in my offices. So we decided to build a hobby scale aquaponics demonstration system um, as part of a region-wide effort to educate people, let them get some hands-on training on assistance. So, you know, the first thing in extension that we have to do is we have to find some money. Uh, we're lucky we have about a third of an acre behind our office here in Walton County and we are, our master gardeners already had a greenhouse, but they weren't really using it. It was kind of in, disrepair. Uh, we also do chick chain, which is the 4-H chickens. We have honeybees. We have an herb garden. Um, we have um, citrus trees, different things like that. Um, so we thought aquaponics would fit in well into this demonstration garden greenhouse area uh, thing. So I applied and got a $1,500 Sea Grant mini grant. And my goal was to try to locally source all of the materials for this uh, so that I wasn't having to go to specialty, specialty uh, stores. So I tried to get everything at Tractor Supply, Lowe's, and Amazon.com uh, for the other things. This is just a list of the different components. And again, I, I'll remind you, um, no matter what type of system you're going to use, many of the components are the same. So you're going to need a fish tank. In this case, it was a 300-gallon Rubbermaid stock tank. Um, something to turn into a biofilter here. I used a 20 gallon uh, garbage can and I stuffed it with bird netting. The bird netting uh, slows down the water, enables you to reduce or to remove the uneaten feed and feces. And then the bird netting um, gives you surface area for the bacteria also to um, go through the, to, you know, remove the ammonia or transfer the ammonia into uh, nitrate. I used these uh, two long troughs as grow beds. They're probably only 80 inches deep when full. And then all the water gravity fed down into a sump where I had a sump pump. And then I have a garden hose that runs back and dumps it in the tank. Uh, there's a few other miscellaneous things that you need, the fish, the feed, the styrofoam, water quality kits. And I was able to spend 1500 um, on this system. So here you can actually see the system during construction. Uh, here's the tank. There's bird netting over the tank. And, uh, but, but you'll see, even though there was a very tiny little gap right here in the bird netting, you'll see what the fish managed to escape anyway. Um, so there's a standpipe in the middle of the fish tank, and that controls the height of the water. So the water goes in the standpipe here, and then it's connected, and it pushes back up into the biofilter, which again is full of bird netting, right? 
So this slows down the water, uneaten feed and feces drops to the bottom, and then I can remove it into a bucket, uh, which I use to basically, um, I put on other plants that are in the greenhouse. Then the water gravity flows from the biofilter in here to the float beds. We have the two float beds raised up on these cinder blocks. Gravity fed, feeds all the way down until it comes down here into the sump pump. You can see the pump in here is hooked to a garden hose. The garden hose is attached to the side of the greenhouse and goes all the way back to the fish tank. So the whole system runs on this one pump, moves all of the water, and then I have one air pump that supplies air to both the fish tank and I have some air stones underneath my plants to make sure the roots are getting uh, the oxygen that they need. So we went and we got our fish uh, from a local uh, dealer. We went with catfish because that's readily available here. So we were floating that and we went ahead and got some seeds and put them into the rock wall and they started sprouting. So we were just so excited to run our first little experiment while we were still like breaking in the system and the bottom fell out quite literally. This tank was sitting where the corner of this cinder block poked up into the bottom. It had just got off center of these ridges just a little bit and put a hole in the bottom of our fish tank and completely drained the fish tank. Also, three of the fish had jumped out uh, overnight and by the next morning because of these voracious ants that we have here, this is all that I found uh, on the floor here of my little catfish fingerlings. So despite that 30 years of aquaculture experience, <laughs> <laughs> things still happen. So uh, then just to keep you humble, <laughs> I came in the next morning and what little lettuce I did have growing was chewed off. And there was some telltale signs of a visitor uh, during the night. And so uh, we knew that we had attracted a, a rodent. And so we put out some uh, rodent be gone squares. And uh, pretty soon uh, we found our little friend and were able to uh, address that problem. But again, uh, like anything in agriculture, uh, you're going to have some roadblocks along the way and you just have to, to deal with them. Here's some later shots of the system. Uh, oh, I, we did end up putting a shade cloth right over the fish because it does get uh, a lot really bright in there and fish like it a little bit dark. Uh, you can see here we were growing a lot of tomato plants in here at the time. So even though it's a small system, we were able to get a lot of uh, produce out of here. Um, the leafy greens always do the best, the different kinds of lettuces, of course, basil, uh, bok choy and bok choy are my uh, go-to summer crops because they really handle um, the, the heat better. Um, the kale handles heat okay, Swiss chard, of course, none of the lettuces like our summers here. And then along the way, we inherited one of these, somebody gave us one of these uh, used barrel systems that uses the expanded clay. Uh, so we inherited that and put a couple fish in here and, and started growing uh, in the barrel system as well. And so we were well on our way to our fish har our fish sandwich. You can see our uh, first harvest here. We got a variety of lettuces. Our catfish uh, did quite well. They went from about a two to three inch fingerling, which was what we stocked. And in about 10 months, they were about a pound and a quarter. So and that's about the size that I like to take them out of the system. Um, I, I leave a few of the large ones in there and then I put in new fingerlings. We don't have any, um, you know, cannibalism problems or anything. Just some different shots of the system. Underneath the high tomatoes, we did try to grow some more lettuces and leafy greens so that we take good advantage of all the space in the system. Sugar snap peas are popular in the spring and fall and do really well. Uh, the flowering plants, though, are a bit more of a challenge. We do have to add some extra nutrients for tomatoes and and, and peas. Um, again, the, the bok choys, the mini bok choys, um, lettuces, just more leafy greens is, is predominantly what we grow uh, for the um, uh, demonstration. You can, this is just another, another shot. You can see the fish tank through the float beds. Um, this is where we started with the, the small barrel system. We were trying some new plants. We actually successfully grew some uh, turmeric in here, which was really nice. Eat root crops do okay in, in these. They're a little bit misshapen, but for turmeric, it's already misshapen, so it doesn't matter. Um, tried some, um, I can't remember if that was squash or, or cucumbers, uh, but just some different plants that we tried, and I didn't get very good pictures, but 
So the conclusions, again, aquaponics is more popular than ever. Um, there's limited research-based information a lot online. There's a ton of wrong information online. So I always encourage my clients to be uh, very careful about going down rabbit holes. But uh, we felt that having that demonstration system right here at the office really helped enhance the learning experience for our clientele that can make it here uh, to see it. Um, I always encourage them to start out with a small pilot system because even, like I said, even with my experience, mis mistakes were made. It's, it's not always easy. And your best bet is to stay connected with the research organizations. Um, I started a listserv uh, in an effort to kind of create this community of practice. It's called the Panhandle Aquaponics Listserv. Uh, you can send me your first and last name uh, to my email, which I'll have up later as well. And I can put you on the listserv. Um, it's not a super busy listserv, but I put whenever new research comes out or there's training opportunities around the country, um, I put it on the, the listserv. And um, I think now we have about 240 people on that listserv. So uh, there's not a lot of discussion. It's all me pushing uh, information out. But if you want to just have kind of a, a thumb on what's happening in aquaponics, uh, that's a good way to do it. Uh, this is another system near us called Coldwater Creek. Um, they grow in these big, this is pea gravel they're using in their systems, very heavy systems, and they run their whole system on koi, uh, an ornamental fish, but they take all their vegetables to the Pensacola uh, farmer's markets. So again, if you want uh, that information on training um, and uh, any new research that comes out, you can send me, email me, and I'll put you on our listserv. I also have a, I've created a two page fact sheet of my favorite aquaponic links. Um, my very favorite is this one right here put out by FAO, especially if somebody's going to do small scale, uh, small scale aquaponic food production. It's available free uh, on the web. Um, if you read this book and it's, it's very well written, it was intended, of course, for uh, developing countries, but it, it works really well for uh, people getting into the small scale aquaponics. It's not for commercial scale aquaponics, but small scale. Uh, if you read this book, you will have a very good understanding of the process, what you can grow, how to build a system. This is a great place. If you can get people to read it, it's a great place for people to start. But I also have links to videos on there, training opportunities, other research projects that have been done. So if you want a cheat sheet that you can modify, put your name on it and shoot off to any clients that uh, ask you for aquaponic information, uh, email me and I'll share it with you and you can plagiarize it all you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's very important to, to network and find support so that you don't feel uh, hopeless when things uh, happen to you. So um, that's what I've got for you today. We still have some time for uh, some Q&A. You can see my um, email is up here, my cell phone number. Uh, again, I don't know if somebody can, let's see, put that in the chat. Let me go ahead and stop sharing the screen and we'll see if there's any questions. Oh, here's one in the Q and A. It says, is pollination an issue for the flowering, flowering plants? Um, yes. It is. Uh, when you're, it's just like any other greenhouse situation. Uh, if you don't have uh, moving air, um, pollination can be um, a problem. I know in a lot of the commercial operations, they use you know um, different techniques to pollinate. Um, some of my smaller growers just use you know the electric uh, toothbrush. Some of them actually uh, you know release bees into their uh, greenhouses. So yeah, just like growing them in any type of greenhouse situation, uh, it's going to be an issue. And then Glenn asks, are there any extra food safety considerations for aquaponic grown produce? Um, yes, there are. And unfortunately, they are not um, always well communicated or easy to find out because a lot of people don't know. Uh, aquaponics, the produce grown in aquaponics can be certified organic, but the fish cannot. And this is because they consider the, the fish, no, there's no aquaculture fish in the United States that can, be that can be labeled organic because they look at the feed that we're feeding the fish and it contains wild fish, uh, which they consider 
not organic for some reason. And so we've never been able to get um, uh, the fish part of it certified organic, but people have successfully gotten their produce. Um, you have to be very careful. There's a couple in this uh, fact sheet that I have, there are a couple of, uh, there's a link to some videos. Um, I wouldn't say the food considerations are any different, but they don't want the water touching the produce. So there's suggestions on how to harvest the produce. You don't wanna lift up your styrofoam tray and then let the roots drip water all over your other plants while you're moving it over to the processing thing. So there's some things that you have to do. So I wouldn't say that they're different than any handling any other produce, but there's probably just some tips or tricks that you need to take into consideration. And then- So Laura, there's a question there from Ron Rice, which I think you've very adequately addressed. And if we've not uh, addressed that fully, Ron, please respond back. Also a question from Anastasia. Uh, is residue an issue from anything from tanks, even if they are food grade? You know, that's a good question. Not that I know of. Um, the food grade tanks, um, again, have all been uh, accepted as far as, uh, um, you know, being able to be certified uh, organic. So I've not heard of any uh, food grade type problems with the tanks. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing another chat question. I've uh, had a couple of my own come up, Laura, if I may. Uh, are there some temperature range specifications uh, that are in the fact sheets about uh, recommended ambient air temperatures as well as water temperatures? And then also there information in the fact sheet about uh, the specifications for, the, for water quality. Regarding water quality here in Utah, we have a lot of calcium carbonate and depending upon where you are in the country, uh, both municipal systems and home systems have various water quality issues. So are there information in those resources that would, uh, would help answer those kinds of questions? Yeah, yeah. So that's the, the challenge of aquaponics is that you have to find that compromise of something that works for both the fish and the plants. Um, so a lot of times you hit on one, temperature is a big uh, issue for you have to find a temperature where your fish can survive and grow and your plants can survive and grow. Uh, the other one that is probably most important in aquaponics systems is pH. Most plants grow best at a pH of uh, 6.5. Um, most are, you know, say, say six to seven. Um, and again, I'm not a plant expert, but uh, most fish grow best at a pH of seven to nine. And so you really want to keep your pH neutral or slightly acidic in order to get the best plant growth and, you know, for your fish to be able to survive. So there are various water quality parameters that you have to deal with. If you have iron in your system, like we have very low iron in our system, and so we supplement uh, with iron, but you may already have some iron in your system that's uh, available. Um, so those are all important considerations. That book, that FAO book, along with some of the other uh, resources that are, are linked in that fact sheet, definitely go into more information on um, wa water quality. Okay, very good. So I'm, I'm going to take one of the later questions here first. Uh, can you, uh, uh, Laura, put the links to the fact sheet in the chat box? And then those participants that are watching the chat box can, uh, can readily have that link. And uh, while you're doing that, I'll back up here a little bit. A question from uh, Anastasia about being able to view this later. Yes, Anastasia, this uh, program is being, uh, is being recorded and it will be posted uh, 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 on the NACA's website. I don't know exactly when that will occur. Uh, maybe Scott could, uh, could jump in and uh, maybe give us an idea of the process on when that would take. But yes, uh, the, the short answer is uh, this will be available. Uh, from Brooke Edmonds, uh, regarding uh, home systems, 10 gallons, he's asking, can you float the plants directly in the fish tanks for best uh, or best to keep separate uh, and pump the water to the plants? Oh, you can you can flow it directly in the tank. Um, you have to make sure that the fish that you have in your tank are not the ones that eat root systems. So if you have fish in there that are herbivores and they like to nibble on the roots, uh, that's not going to work for floating your plants directly in there. But uh, other than that, um, you can. Or if you had some kind of you know guard where the fish couldn't get up into the into the roots. But I wanted to say I I don't have that fact sheet online, so I can't put a link to it but they can email me or I can send you the fact sheet and you can distribute it um, 
through your channels, what, whatever I think works best for everybody. Oh, okay, so Scott's, yeah. Same. Yes, so Scott is posting there that uh, he will be re uh, posting the YouTube video within 24 hours. So watch for the, the link uh, for uh, for that uh, coming. And then he's also will uh, do an e-blast on the link to everybody that's here. Uh, Laura's just posting uh, her email for the fact sheet. So uh, check those in the links. A uh, couple more questions here as we have time. Uh, are there popular pond culture fish that don't do well in these small aquaponic systems? I was thinking of various things like carp, et cetera. Yeah, carp actually do very well in these systems. A lot of um, a lot of the growers that I work with here in Florida uh, do not intend to eat their fish. So they're just looking for a good hardy fish to feed and drive their system. And they like uh, koi and carp because koi and carp eat a very inexpensive diet. Um, they can, you can get away with like a 28% protein diet where if you were growing, if you were trying to grow um, a carnivore, like a large mouth bass or a yellow perch, they're going to require a higher protein diet, hence it's more expensive. Um, so, so carps do do fine. Uh, tilapia do great. I'm trying to think if there's something that doesn't do well. In, any, um, if you can culture it in a, a tank for aquaculture, then it, typically does well in these systems. So, um, you know, you want to look for a fish again, readily available, goes on feed easily. Um, bluegill do fine. Um, yellow perch, largemouth bass. What about trout? Well, trout, you're going to run into a temperature issue, right? Because trout do best with temperatures not higher than 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And so you have to match uh, the plants that you're growing to all that also do well at those cooler uh, temperatures. So yes, in places with um, that have cold temperatures, trout are being used in these aquaponic systems, and they do very well with your colder uh, weather plants, maybe some of your lettuces, uh, things like that. But I wouldn't recommend it if you're in some place like Florida and it's hot to be able to get temperature you have to have a chiller. And it would be very expensive to chill that water to be able to maintain trout. We have an aquaculture industry here in some places in the states in the west, and we have cool climate. We, we, yeah, we can get roaring hot in the summer, but we've got cold winter temperatures, but trout is, uh, is quite readily available in places. Yeah, so. Great trout farms out there. Uh, another question here from Kevin Livingston. Do you see any total systems? Total what? Total gravity systems. And Kevin, maybe if you jump on, I and maybe elaborate on the question. Total gravity systems. The only thing that I can think, is, without further clarification, uh, maybe not using no electrical pump. I gotcha. Um, the only place that I've seen that is you, I, is where if you won't, yeah, not no electrical pump. I've seen them without a water pump because I have seen systems that use air, an air pump lift system. So they're using the air pump to recirculate the water, but never, I have not seen a system without an electrical pump. Doesn't mean it's not out there. <laughs> it's probably on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> Here in the West, we use a lot of small electrical pump systems that are solar powered. Uh, and yeah. Have you uh, an application for? We use them often for uh, uh, water for livestock, uh, drinking water system, etc. Uh, uh, a final uh, call for questions, uh, Scott. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but we're. We're getting uh, 46 minutes into our discussion. Uh, if we have any additional questions, uh, I'm watching the chat. Let me close and look back at Q&A. Uh, in Q&A, uh, Dan Davenport is asking, if using saltwater fish species, what or how do you address the salt levels on the roots of the plants? Yeah, uh, well, they're, they're using plants that can tolerate salt water. And so they're using some of these... Uh, they're actually growing um, plants for restoration, not for food. So they're, well, I mean, they have some that they're growing for food, 
uh, that can that are um, uh, halophyte, so they like that salt water. But they're also growing restoration plants for dune restoration and things like that. So these are the plants are actually chosen that can tolerate salt water. But I did visit a place in Germany um, that was doing saltwater aquaponics. They were growing a lot of um, brackish water fish in a large indoor recirculating system, and they were growing uh, cherry tomatoes. And it was really interesting because the cherry tomatoes, the variety they had, which they would not share with us, was growing in, um, I don't even remember what the uh, parts per thousand were of the salt water, but when you bit into the tomato, it actually tasted salty, like a pre-salted tomato. And so I thought that was a uh, great, I've not seen that replicated here in the United States, but um, thought, wow, that's, that's definitely a niche market there. Some pre-salted cherry tomatoes, if somebody can figure that out. Again, I'm not a plant person. I'm always going to my uh, uh, horticulture and agriculture uh, agents to help me with the plant part of it. I definitely have a brown thumb. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, another question in the Q&A, uh, Aaron is asking, can a PDF of these slides be, be made available? And I would offer, uh, we surely can, uh, or we'll figure out a way to do that uh, to be able to make the PowerPoints available. Is that amenable to you, Laura? Sure, what I'll do, Jody, is I will, I will email you my fact sheet uh, as a Word document. So again, people can modify it and add their name to it. And it's just a real quick way to quickly like a call for aquaponics, you can send that out and that's going to address 90% of the people. <laughs> and then 10% will actually read it and come back to you and, you know, ask a, a additional questions. So it might save you all some time. And then I'll also include um, a PDF of my uh, presentation. You can send it out and people can trash it if they don't want it. And... Okay, I will, uh, I, I will do that. Just and checking that, like we've answered there. And uh, I think we've answered the questions that are in the Q&A. I'm missing some somewhere. If not, please uh, uh, please uh, put a quick message in the chat uh, so that we uh, cover any remaining questions. Uh, Laura, you seen anything that we haven't addressed at this point? I believe we're probably there. Uh, so. Again, we'll remind uh, uh, all of you if uh, you'll watch for the message from Scott Hawbreaker uh, to, uh, uh, to respond to the evaluation for, for this webinar on behalf of the uh, Natural Resource and Aquaculture Committee with NICAA. We're very uh, appreciative of Laura for her willingness to uh, make this presentation. And uh, if you would provide some feedback to that evaluation, we would very much appreciate it. Scott, I'm seeing you coming back on. Do you have any additional instructions for us? Nope, I'm good. I'll, uh, what I will do is if, Laura, if you could send me or, or copy me on that, on the fact sheet and the slide PDF, then what I'll do is include that with the YouTube link. So all in one e-blast to everybody. So they'll have the attachments and that would work for me. Okay, very good. Thank you, Scott. Uh, if I may be so bold as to suggest that uh, we, we appreciate all of you getting on the webinar. And in addition to the topic today, if you have some feedback on uh, how this webinar series is going, that uh, NACAA leadership is making available, uh, please uh, provide some comments back either to myself or especially Scott or others. Uh, your uh, various uh, directors, uh, we would welcome feedback how we can improve the webinar series uh, to meet your needs. Thank you and thank you for participating. Thank you all. Sorry, I think I keep dropping off there. <laughs> I shouldn't have mentioned that good technology juju, should I? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that jinxes us. <laughs> I did hear you say to CC you on the email, Scott, so I'll do that. Thank you both okay. for ha having me today. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you. All right.